I'm Joe Carbonetta, and this is Arroyo Live. This program is produced by and through the facilities of Pasadena Media. Created to help inform and restore a sense of connection for those feeling isolated by the COVID-19 pandemic, it is the continued hope of this program to help bring together and strengthen our community through informative and meaningful conversation. To that end, this program is live if you are watching on Tuesday, August 4th, and there will be an opportunity to call in with your questions or comments later on in the program. You can submit them anytime via email to arroyolive at pasadenamedia.org. Tonight, we discuss the impact COVID-19 is having on renters and landlords and the different struggles each of them now face. For this topic, I'm joined by Ms. Anne-Marie Villacana, a realtor, lawyer, and former Pasadena City Council member, and Mr. Ryan Bell, a tenant organizer with the Pasadena Tenants Union. Thank you both for joining me tonight. I'd like to ask each of you to please take a moment to tell our viewers at home a little bit more about yourselves. Anne-Marie, we'll begin with you. All right, well, thank you so much for having me. So I'm Anne-Marie Villacana, and I have been just about a lifelong resident of Pasadena. And the only reason I wasn't born here was my father was asked to, uh, actually he was drafted into the military. And so uh, I was born overseas in a military hospital, but otherwise would be a lifelong resident here. So I am a real estate broker, I'm a real estate attorney. I really know probably just about everything there is to know about Pasadena and um, served as a city council member in District 6 where Steve Madison serves now. I served as the president of Pasadena Rotary, served as president of the convention center, so many different things. Um, been a assessment appeals board judge uh, for the last four years. I served on the California State Fair Employment and Housing Commission. So I'm very, very familiar with real estate. And I'm really looking forward to um, talking tonight about you know, real estate and landlords and the situation right now with COVID-19. But I think the biggest thing is that I think as a nation, we have lost our moral compass. And I think that we have lost the sense of what is right and wrong. And I'm really looking forward to discussing these issues um, with regard to real estate in Pasadena. Well, again, we thank you for joining us tonight. Ryan, your turn. Thank you for having me. Um, I uh, have lived here in Pasadena for about seven years. Before that, I was um, just down the, down the road in Los Feliz for the eight years before that. Um, I'm a tenant in District 6, um, and I have been a tenant all my life, even though I'm now approaching 50 years old, because I've been in nonprofit work all my life. I've, uh, for 20 years, I was clergy uh, in different parts of the country, and then um, have worked in homeless services for a few years, and now work in student support services uh, for college students, uh, supporting secular college students around the country. Um, I'm a, a member and organizer with the Pasadena Tenants Union here in, in the city, and we work with several hundred um, of our members who are um, housing insecure, and especially since the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen um, tremendous insecurity reaching into um, another tier of our, of our community that probably never thought that they would be housing insecure. And, um, and so we, we work to create, like any union would, um, political power for an underrepresented group of people, which is actually the majority of Pasadena residents. So about 55% of Pasadena residents are tenants. And, um, and you, but you wouldn't really know it necessarily by um, the political dynamics. And so that's, that's kind of the work I do it, as a volunteer. Um, in different coalitions uh, as well around the county. Ryan, again, wonderful to have you with us this evening. Thank you so much for joining us as well. Uh, of course, if you watch any of the, the local news outlets, uh, it's become painfully aware that we've seen a substantial uptick in the number of infections and hospitalizations in recent weeks. Uh, unfortunately, COVID seems to have gone exactly the opposite direction during the summer months that uh, certain members of, of the health industry and, and perhaps uh, even the administration were hoping for. Um, and there are probably a myriad of reasons for this happening. But uh, as we generally do with just about every one of our episodes, we like to begin by asking each of our guests how 
COVID-19 has affected you on a personal level. So again, uh, Anne-Marie, and I don't mean to keep putting you uh, in the hot seat there, but if you wouldn't mind, we'd like to, to begin with you. How has COVID affected you directly? Oh, it's impacted me significantly, just like I think it has impacted everyone. Um, it would be uh, crazy if you weren't impacted negatively in some way from this. Fortunately, I don't know anybody um, very close that has been sick or contracted the coronavirus, but there's certainly um, that constant concern and worry. Uh, my own mother has been very, very sick several times just by panic. And I've now taken to calling it the coronavirus panic that you know, older people, my mom, a good friend of mine's father and a good friend of mine's mother-in-law all have gone to the hospital several times or gone to the doctors to get tests because of the panic and the concern that they might contract coronavirus, even if they're not even leaving their homes because they're afraid that either someone bringing them their food or helping them out might have brought the disease in and they're not aware of it if they catch a little cough or anything that seems out of the ordinary. So as a real estate broker, um, it brought you know, my business to a screeching halt. I had two properties in escrow right as coronavirus was um, hitting in early March. And um, you know, I represented the sellers on both of those and both of the buyers and the agents disappeared. So um, you know, after trying to figure out whether this was worth doing this or not and listening to Zoom after Zoom after Zoom, day after day after day in those first few weeks, I decided as a realtor, you know, it's we had been turning to housekeepers because if we had a listing or have a listing, we have to go and sanitize every single time after a showing and, you know, in preparation for each showing. And so I just decided it's not worth the risk. You know, I have older parents and I have a took off one entire month um, from, I guess it was early March, uh, second week of March until um, probably about, um, I think it was June 1st, probably a little bit longer than a month. And then I said, you know, this is crazy. I can only stay inside so long and people need a house. There still is housing needs and people were still moving, but very few. And um, so I started at least renting properties. And, um, but that has been excruciating because, you know, in the past you could say maybe like five people would see a property and then it would lease. I mean, it's like 20, 25, 30 people before you can get it to lease now. And um, so it's been really difficult. So uh, I can say it's been rough and um, I'm not taking any PPP money and I haven't requested any. And um, I am hunkering down with the savings that, uh, you know, I work to have so that if there were an emergency, but this is becoming a long emergency. Perhaps the, the longest rainy day in history. Uh, Ryan, yes. same question over to you. How, how have you been directly affected? Uh, and, and in fact, do you know of anybody that has, has contracted COVID-19? Yeah, um, you know, I, my first reaction to that question is always to be really grateful. Um, I have a, a job that I've been able to continue working from home. Uh, I work with college students around the country. And for the most part, my work is remote even on, a, on the best day. Um, we communicate via Zoom and phone and, and social media with our students all over the country. So that really didn't change for me, although I am working from home in a rather small apartment where my partner also works uh, from home. And so that's been a, a, an unusual kind of new adjustment. Um, my, my children live primarily with their mom, just about five minutes from me, also in Pasadena. And uh, I think the biggest feeling for me is feeling anxious about seeing my kids and, and hearing that they go out to see their friends. Not a lot, but they'll, you know, after four or five months, you know, they're eager to see their friends and, and um, not sure how close I should get to them. And they have aging grandparents as well. And, you know, it's hard to keep teenagers bound you know, it's it's uh, it's kind of hard to to understand for them sometimes. I think the biggest change for me has been my work with the tenants union. We um, we were working on a, a variety of of issues, and and then just overnight, people couldn't pay their rent. You know, they lost their income, and um, it it became a crisis for people that 
were securely, well, you know, relatively speaking, securely housed. Um, now we get three to four phone calls and emails to our um, our hotline every day. Um, tenants that that can't pay their rent and aren't sure what to do. And even when the law is on their side, they're scared. Um, people live in a, a decent amount of fear every day of their landlords. Um, they don't wanna bother their landlords about anything because they're afraid of that it might negatively reflect on them and they might have some repercussions. And so people are, are frightened of, of what's gonna happen and, and understandably so. And so I think my volunteer work has probably doubled uh, since March. Um, but I'm, you know, I, I've, um, my, this is going to be a little, a little uh, convoluted. My daughter's boyfriend's grandfather just recently passed away from passed COVID. Away. He passed away? Yeah, oh. he, he passed away from COVID. Um, so that's probably the closest the disease has come to me. Um, I have friends whose family members have been sick. Um, my, my partner's coworker got sick and is now recovering. So I've known some people that have, have definitely been close to it. Um, luckily, I've uh, my immediate family has been safe. Well, we certainly are saddened to learn that it has struck closer to home, and, and, and our hearts certainly go out to anyone who has lost a loved one as a result of this. Uh, I think it's, it's not a stretch to say that uh, each of you, Brian and Anne-Marie, you, you have, you, you approach the situation from slightly different points of view, which, uh, to be completely honest, is one of the reasons that we wanted to have you both on the show this evening, to present both sides of, of every story. Um, that having been said, I was hoping that each of you would take a moment to speak to the challenges that are currently affecting landlords and tenants as a result of COVID-19 and all that has come along with this pandemic. Um, and well, I, I, was, oh, I was going to say, I was going to suggest maybe Ryan go first this time because we put you on the spot. But Anne Marie, you look like you're ready to jump in there, so I'll I'll defer to you. I'm always I'm always ready to talk about real estate. So I think one of the biggest challenges that landlords have had is one, as I said, there was this period where nobody could do anything, and that was very hard because you know people did have units or houses that were vacant, and there was such an uncomfortable quality because everybody was supposed to stay at home and not leave the premises in the event, because no one knew anything at that point um, as to how this was being transmitted, not that we know it now. And so it was very hard because the majority of property owners that have investment property are small mom and pops who have one or two units, maybe a duplex, a fourplex, maybe a, a one single family house. And without that income coming in, it really jeopardizes um, their nest egg and their investment being able to pay their rent and things like that. So that really is an enormous challenge. And then for the landlords who had tenants who were able to continue paying their rent, you know, such a blessing because they were so grateful and thankful that these people would continue honoring their commitment um, through their contract with the landlord. But there are some people, not many, fortunately, that are unfortunately taking advantage of the situation because then once it was set up that there could be no evictions for non-payment of rent, there always is a bad actor amongst the group and some people have been very good tenants. I have a client who had a very good tenant and um, we've been seven, eight years, just decided since he didn't have to pay the rent and there was no repercussion um, immediately on eviction, stopped paying the rent and did not pay April, May, June, July. Now we're into August. And that's wrong from so many standpoints because this is where I'm saying our moral compass is off you can't expect someone else to cover the rent for you if you're not even making an attempt. And that is wrong. That is stealing. In any way you look at it, it's stealing. And I think, you know, if the government says that the landlord has an obligation to not proceed with eviction hearing or any three day notice, because nothing will be done with that three day notice anyway, then it also behooves the government to say, you know what, maybe we also need to consider giving vouchers to these landlords who really are probably struggling themselves to make their mortgage payments. If the air conditioning goes out, if the plumbing goes out, the landlord has an obligation to repair those items. They can't just say, hey, we're not doing it. You figure it out. 
And I think there needs to be that working situation. And there are so many, I would say the majority of relationships between landlords and tenants are extremely well planned and thought out. They were thought out from the beginning when they uh, viewed the property, when they wrote out the lease, and usually a landlord and tenant become really friendly with one another um, so that you don't have this uncomfortable situation. But it's difficult when a tenant does not follow even the directives, like the city of Pasadena had a required notice to tenants. And so all the landlords had to give this notice to the tenants at the end of May, early part of June. And, you know, explaining that the tenant had a responsibility that if they were not able to pay the rent, you have to create a dialogue and you have to explain this to the landlord. I mean, you can't just not pay. And so when that's honored, you know, things work out. But when it's not honored and it's silent and they refuse to take phone calls and it just won't help out, not even pay a dollar towards any utilities that are being paid and the insurance that's been paid and the, you know, the uh, water bill and the electric bill and the trash bill and the gardening bill, that becomes a little bit difficult. And so now we're looking at a moratorium on uh, any kind of eviction until at least the end of September. And most likely that will extend further. So I think there's certainly possibilities for this to be a very good relationship on both sides, but it's when you get a bad actor in there that it makes it difficult. All right. And Ryan, over to you. Um, I, I'm, I'm certain that you would have a, a slightly different perspective on this being a, a tenant organizer. And so we would definitely like to hear about the challenges mm -hmm. that the tenants face. Yeah. Um, you know, I, you know, I think that morality is a, is a good place to start in this conversation. Um, and I think the, the guiding principle that has um, animated our work, as well as um, what we're encouraging lawmakers to do, is that nobody should be, first of all, nobody should be without a home. Like, my conviction is that from a moral perspective, that housing is a human right. And people have a right to housing, people have a right to food, um, they have a right to live you know, and, and, and thrive in their lives. Um, and certainly during a pandemic, people shouldn't be forced out of their homes. I don't, you know, I, I've, I've hear these um, stories about um, people who just decided to stop paying their rent, um, even though they could afford to pay it. I, I don't know of any of those people. Um, we've had several hundred calls from people who um, the landlords are threatening to evict them, even though they, it's illegal to do so. We've had to physically intervene to stop evictions, illegal evictions from happening. Um, we've had tenants threatened uh, with illegal lockouts, um, people who have lost their entire income due to no fault of their own. They were working, they were being responsible. They were working really hard to make all of their obligations. And I, we, you know, I probably talk at least to two tenants a week, different, two different tenants a week who, can't afford the rent because they've literally been laid off. They can't find a new job because nobody's hiring and they are terrified of not paying their rent. And I tell them, look, the law is going to protect you in the meantime, like you're going to be okay. And they're still so scared. They, they have given their, you know, their savings, everything to the landlord. So um, on the other side of it, you know, we have landlords who aren't, you know, speaking of not picking up the phone, like landlords who just don't respond to calls for repairs, uh, people who want to negotiate uh, a, a lower rent in the meantime so that they can keep paying a partial rent, uh, demanding that everything be paid immediately. So we, you know, our calls for about harassment have gone through the roof. Um, and I know everyone is scared. Landlords are scared too. Um, I'm not, I'm not convinced that depending on how you define mom and pop that the majority of landlords in Pasadena are mom and pop. I don't know. I don't know what qualifies as a mom and pop to, to um, They're quite and, good. but um, we, you know, They're thousands. mostly They're LLCs. Thousands. We, I'm sorry. We see mostly LLCs and, um, and corporate other corporations that are moving in, buying up big buildings, evicting everyone and raising the rent. Um, that's kind of the general pattern. Ryan, in, in your uh, opening introduction, I think you mentioned a statistic that suggested, and correct me if I'm not quoting this correctly, but I believe that you said that there are 53% of the people in Pasadena that are tenants, meaning there are more renters or leasers 
in the city than actual property owners. Uh, that having been said, what does it do to a person to have an eviction on their record? Because th that isn't something that goes away anytime soon. In fact, I believe, and again, please correct me if I'm wrong, that if you are slapped with an eviction, that remains on your record for between seven and 10 years. It's as bad as any other black mark on your credit, making it increasingly difficult, if not impossible, for you to find other housing afterward. So, so what are the effects of those uh, for the tenant and for the landlord? Yeah, I mean, it's really difficult. I mean, I, we, we talk to people all the time. In fact, not too long ago, we had someone join our weekly legal clinic who had this exact question. Um, and there's, there's really no way to expunge this from someone's record. Understandably, you know, landlords want to know if they can trust a tenant. Um, but, but an eviction is almost a non-starter for, for, you know, a lot of landlords. And, um, so I think it's, you know, it's really difficult. People should avoid an eviction at all costs if they can. Um, it's something that- I agree. I, I'm sorry? I said, I agree. You don't want yeah. an eviction. I've, I've I've had a, yeah, I've had a car repossessed because I lost a job um, and I just voluntarily gave it back to the bank because there was just literally nothing I could do in time um, because the whole industry that I was in just kind of collapsed and um, I, I couldn't get decent credit for a car for 10 years. Um, and so I think the whole credit system is, is really broken. It really doesn't allow people to uh, make amends and get back on their feet in a, in a reasonable amount of time. Um, it's very punitive. And uh, people, well, I, I will offer a different way to look at I this mean, eviction thing. Okay. I'm, I'm not sure. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to interrupt though in saying that on these evictions, you know, evictions don't just happen because you haven't paid rent one time. It's usually that you haven't paid rent for a while and you refuse to pay rent and you will not even work with the landlord. It's not something that just is thrown at you. And so when you speak of these bad landlords, there, as I said, there are some bad tenants. There are some bad landlords. It's just inevitable that well, that's going to happen. Dennis Block is advising landlords to evict anyone who doesn't pay rent once. And He's going around holding conferences and conventions, advising landlords to evict as fast as possible. And we get calls yes, from these tenants who are being victimized by people now. like Dennis Block. Yeah, but you can't, yes, but I've listened to Dennis Block, but he, you cannot do any eviction at this time because the courts aren't open for the eviction process. So all he's recommending is if you want to file, at least you'll get in line now. But, um, you know, a lot of people aren't doing that because it's just, it's too complicated. and. A lot of times, as I said, if I'm going back to these mom and pop uh, operators, they don't understand how you're supposed to do it. And they don't want to go down to a courthouse or they don't know how to figure out how to file uh, whatever that documentation is, or they are unable to uh, spend the money right now to get an attorney. But the eviction itself, um, you said that there's really no way to get that off your record. I will completely contest that because there are many, many landlord um uh, or tenant right advocates out there right now that are even allowed to sit in the courthouses when the courthouses are open as a property owner representing a property owner attorney representing property owners. You, it, you, you're not allowed to set up shop in a courthouse, but you can set up shop if you are representing tenants and you can solicit clients in a courthouse. And those um, attorneys in the courthouses that represent the tenants are paid with our tax dollars. So to say that uh, there is no way to get that expunged is ridiculous because people can go and they can go through the eviction process, go through the court. They can stay in a home rent free for months and months and months, forget even the uh, pandemic or the quarantine. They did this before this happened and they can stay for all these months and there's really nothing that the landlord can do. And at the end, oftentimes, because the mom and pop is not as sophisticated as these government paid uh, lawyers, representing the tenants, the, the tenant's record of an eviction is expunged from the record. So that if any future application is made by that tenant, and then the landlord is savvy enough to know how to look up for an eviction, they're not gonna find that eviction record. So that's wrong. And so that's not correct either. So I go back to our moral compass is off. And when people are doing things that aren't correct, it's not right for the landlord because you get stuck with a bad person who isn't intent upon honoring their 
agreement. And if they're taking on a rental place, they should know if I can't afford $1,500, $3,000 a month, whatever their rent is, then they need to figure out how to pair back. Bring in a roommate. Should, Move in with we mom should and dad. Homelessness. We should really just expect homelessness. Um, of the forty, I mean, I have this this report in front of me. Of the forty thousand cases, eviction cases last year in LA County, ninety five percent of landlords had representation, and there were fifty entire attorneys um, um, that had that represented um, tenants and. You know, we work with a small, scrappy eviction defense outfit called Eviction Defense Network. There's, there's no way that we have enough attorneys that will, up until just last year, no attorney would take an eviction case in, on the tenant side in Pasadena because you were guaranteed to lose. There were no even just cause protections for tenants in Pasadena until for, uh, AB 1482 was passed. I myself- That's not true. These tenants can stay listen, in there and have. I myself- I myself, excuse me, I myself was evicted with 60 days notice for no fault on Washington Boulevard in Los Robles in 19, in 2017. I got a 60 day notice to quit. I had done nothing wrong. I was sent packing and I lived basically homeless on my friend's sofa for about four months until I was able to find housing. I didn't well, think you had a friend stay on their couch. So you weren't homeless. You were staying somewhere. Different is homeless is you're actually. What you, are you willing to stay on your friend's couch? Is that good for you? If if I had no choice and that was my option, I would do that. And uh, it would be far better than being on a curb under an overpass. I'll tell you that. We need to talk so, about this moral compass a little bit more because that is not acceptable. You know what? I, I'll, I'll go back to this. You know, you, you keep talking about how it's a right. A lot of the people who are under the bridges, who are in the tents, are choosing to be there. They might be mentally ill. Their families can't connect with them, whatever the case is. I remember there was that housing advocate who had those little igloos down off of the or the uh, freeway in downtown LA. I don't remember his name right now, but so many of those people, he said, you know, they choose to be here. So you can't, uh, you can't say that all these people, no, absolutely not. But this back to the evictions, because that's what we were talking about. People are not being evicted right now. And you say that these landlords are trying to evict people. They can say it, but that is harassment. No, no decent landlord right now is saying anything like that because they know it's not accurate. That's and good. I think yeah. the majority of landlords I, that I know, in fact, all of the landlords that I know have been very good landlords and they have worked with their tenants. So I, I don't subscribe to this uh, thing of all these bad landlords. And, you know, when you talk about these attorneys, the landlords who have to hire the attorney, you're lucky if you can find an attorney that will do anything for starting $2,000. Usually you have to put up a $10,000 retainer and you never get that $10,000 back. It's gone. I would be, so I would be happy to, be, before, before we continue on with this spirited discussion, and I, I certainly do appreciate it, I think our viewers do at home, but I would uh, like to point out that uh, we have reached about the halfway mark in the program, and this is traditionally when we open up the telephone lines. So if you'd like to to Call us with your opinions or your questions. You can certainly do so now at area code 951-356-6882, and our phone lines are open. Uh, and, and also, we do have a couple of questions coming in. Uh, these are directed to Ryan, actually. Uh, Ryan, the, the first question that comes in, and there are actually two, but the first one is that, that uh, you say that people have the quote-unquote right to food and housing. Where do these rights come from? And who is responsible to supply them? Yeah, I mean, there. I mean, I think most people are familiar with with human rights, um, the right to live, um, and it's a threat to people's life, especially right now during a pandemic, uh, to not be housed when there's a stay-at-home order for everyone's life and safety. Um, you know, the the biggest thing that you can do to protect your health right now during the COVID nineteen pandemic is to stay home, if you have one. And if you don't have a home, that's really impossible uh, to do. I mean, my my basic contention around human rights is that is is this that we've decided we've taken a a fundamental need that we all have, and we've turned it into a commodity to be traded and and sold and invested in, um, and and then. And then landlords about among all investors, because it isn't it's an investment, it's a personal investment or a business investment. 
And, and investments are subject to gains as well as losses. And, but it seems like landlords among all investors expect to have their investment protected when the cost of rent has gone up at about four times the rate of, of, um, of people's pay of, uh, and cost of living. So, you know, people maybe receive a one to 2% cost of living. Uh, I'm a professional. I work in the managerial class, if you want to say that. And, and I've received one 3% raise in four, in three years. And my, in the same amount of time, my rent's gone up probably 12%, like, a, like 4% a year. Um, and it just, you can't, it's not sustainable. You can't keep doing that. You're going to force people into homelessness. And it's often the same people who uh, are very pro like free market in terms of like, Hey, let's rent this to whatever, whatever people can afford uh, or whatever the market will sustain who also don't want homeless people sleeping in the park in their beautiful suburban neighborhood. Well, guess what? We, the system that we have is perfectly designed to give us the results that we have right now, which is homelessness, displacement, gentrification, people being forced out of communities that they've lived in for generations. Up on Washington Boulevard about a year and a half ago, we had families evicted from an apartment building that had lived there for 40 years. They were raised there. They were raising their kids there. That was their neighborhood and their community. And now they don't live in Pasadena anymore. They live somewhere else in a in further east. And maybe you would say, you know, maybe the moral, the moral compass is that that's just the way it goes, you know, that um, I have people that say to me all the time, you know, friends of mine who are super angry at me for my views that, well, you should live somewhere where you can afford. Um, and <laughs> where is that? And how far should I have to commute to my work? I, I don't mean to interrupt you, Ryan, but there's actually a second part to this question too, and I'll, I'll paraphrase. Uh, the the uh, person asking the question mentioned or references your uh, point that you were evicted with a 60-day notice. And they, the question that they have is, was the uh, landlord operating within the uh, lease agreement? Did he have, was he, did he have proper authority to do that 60-day eviction notice? The you one know, that I was Illegal done when you were evicted. Oh, absolutely. He was well within his right to do that. That was the, according to the law. There it is. It's legal. It had nothing to do with being mean to you. He was following the law for whatever reason. Maybe he wanted to renovate. Maybe his kid wanted to move. Maybe his mother had to move in. So there's no, you have no right to live there. You, when you wrote up your lease, if you wrote a lease, you had it for a finite period of time. That wasn't to set you up for life in that place. And I think what is sad that I'm hearing from you is that you are helping create a lifelong tenant class. And the way I look at it is, you know what? People shouldn't be staying in the same place for 40 years, raising their kids and then raising their kids, all renting from the same landlord. With all that time and all that money that they paid the landlord, it would have been far better had they saved a little bit more each month. And I would imagine on this, most of them were paying below market rents and they knew they were paying below market rents because they stayed there for 40 or however many years. If they had been putting more money aside instead of buying the latest you know, Nintendo Switch for their kid or the latest TV or the latest cruise for the summer vacation, wow. that they should have been putting their money aside. They don't have to live in the best house, in the best neighborhood, in the best city. You can move to an adjacent city, live in a little bit lesser neighborhood so that you can build up your savings. You don't have to create this generational tendency. And I think that's where I think that you need to refocus a little bit that, yes, I don't want people on the streets. That's the last thing anybody wants is these people on the streets. It makes no sense. It's not a good situation for anybody for a lot of reasons, but we also have to encourage people. You know, we love to have long-term tenants, but we also worry about having long-term tenants. You said you didn't get a raise in how many years? Well, I think that maybe if your landlord was raising your rent 2% a year, I don't think most people raise them much. 8 you know, a year, seven, 8% a year. Is it? Well, is then maybe it's below market, but if they were raising it on a regular basis, you should have the strength and fortitude to go to your employer and say, hey, you know what? I work really hard for you and I need to have a little bit more money so I can make my monthly allotments. So 
I think you have to view it as a symbiotic relationship that you're working with your landlord. You're, you don't want your landlord as always above you. I have a you good relationship. And in class. But I have a good relationship. Problem that you uh, create, could, could this become a problem where you create a situation uh, that, that could arguably be considered elitist when you create a situation where you or a, a, a certain class of individuals not able to live in a specific city because they are not of means? Is that, is that a fair assessment? Hey, you know, just real estate prices in general, an expensive house in Pasadena, six, seven million. I think there've been a few, maybe 10, 15 million. That's like middle range in Beverly Hills. So, I mean, it just depends on what you pick. You go back to Texas or you go back to North Carolina, you can buy a beautiful estate, probably for 200,000. So, and you know, they're nice cities, nice states. If you don't have to live in Pasadena, you don't have to live in Beverly Hills. And now because of this pandemic and the quarantine, a lot of people are evaluating, you know what? We can Zoom, we can do our work remotely. And you know what? We don't have to live in tight quarters. You say you live in this tight apartment. And I feel extremely sorry for people who are feeling that. And I have said it from the day one, people being locked up in small apartments, not being able to walk outside, not being able to go walk through the park, not you know being able to walk freely without a mask on their face, without being harassed by someone else saying, you know, you shouldn't be out there without a mask. It's a terrible thing. And I, I feel deeply, profoundly, badly for these people that are in very tight quarters. And, you know, I think that the one good thing, if there is anything good that comes out of this, is that so many people are now being allowed to work remotely. And if you can work remotely and your kids are learning online because they can't go back to school because the schools aren't opening, then you know what? You can get a much nicer house outside of this city. You don't have to be here. And you probably can find that your cost of living will be less. And actually, your rent you can actually make that a mortgage payment. We right now have historically the lowest mortgage rates ever. And um, we have the highest uh, home ownership rate right now, I think since 1984. So this is really incredible. So there's opportunity even in bad situations. Okay, well, Anne-Marie, we, we have another question that has come in via the chat. And this one is actually directed toward you. This comes from okay. Nathaniel. And he's asking, from what... What do you think about the massive influx of eviction notices that were sent out in October of 2019 after the uh, discussion about AB 14, uh, was it 1462? Uh, but before 30. 30. No, or, or is it 82? I'm sorry. But uh, 1482. Um, before it actually went into law, you know, evidently a lot of uh, landlords rushed to evict tenants while they still could before the restrictions were put in place. Uh, well, there are a lot of reasons that. for that. Yeah, there are a lot of reasons for that, that that happened. Um, not everybody did, not all landlords did. And um, this had been brewing for years. We had heard that Pasadena was fomenting with this tenant union. Glendale had been fomenting with the tenant union. And this had been going on for years. So I'm on the local government relations um, committee at the Pasadena Foothill Association of Realtors. Uh, and I meet there regularly once a month with um, my fellow realtors. I think there are maybe 15, 20 of us that meet together. And we knew that there was something brewing in this vein. And so we were educating our clients who had investment properties saying, you know, if you have this just been sitting back and allowing your rent checks to come in month after month, not ever updating your files, not ever updating your rents, it's really time to start evaluating are your rents at market or are they significantly below market? Because pretty soon, we don't know when, but pretty soon you're gonna be limited. And when that time comes, there's nothing you can do. And what happens when mom and pop get old and they pass away and then their kids need to sell the property? Suddenly the property is valued less because you have below market tenants in there. And that becomes a problem. When you aren't getting a significant, the correct amount of rent on the property, you don't have the money to redo the roof. You don't have the money to redo the landscaping. You don't have the money when a $7,000 air conditioning system goes out and you have to replace it. And it happens. And there's nothing you can do as the landlord other than you got to suck it up. You either pull it out of your 401k, your IRA money, your savings fund, or you put it on a credit card 
and you pay very high interest rates to get that air conditioning system set up. But, you know, so what happened was there were a lot of people who were very complacent. And so realtors like myself, real estate lawyers like myself were telling their clients, this is the time to do it. And there was a window. It was completely illegal and there was nothing wrong with it. I mean, our legislators who are the most liberal, some of the most liberal in the entire country are here locally. And they were the ones who set up the rules. So the rules were, if you gave them notice by October 31st, you could legally evict those people because otherwise there was no way you were going to be able to raise the rents. And that's what happened. So there was nothing wrong about it. Well, to borrow a, a phrase that you used early on in the show, which was moral compass, I, I, I'm, uh, I have to ask this one question. Uh, obviously, rents, as, as you were just discussing, uh, are dictated by the market. And if the market bears a certain uh, level of rent, in fact, if, if everything around you is getting that particular rate, then it would make sense for you as a landlord to have your rent set accordingly. But in a, an environment such as the one that Ryan just mentioned, where 53% of the market is tenant and only and less than that, you know, the only 47% are those who actually own the properties, is, is that actually a fair situation then? If they control the market, then they, in essence, can create their own rent. Is that actually fair to the renter? Well, I mean, I, is it fair to the renters to raise their rent? Yes, of course it's fair to raise the rent because, you know, property taxes go up each year. We're, landlords aren't getting any benefit at all right now. What I would suggest, if tenants are allowed to live in their rental unit without paying rent for six, eight, 10, possibly 12 months, this could go on, without paying any rent, then I think what the government in turn should do is then if you as a landlord say, you know, I haven't gotten rent for six, 12 months, I think I in turn should get a pass on paying my property taxes this year. Give something in return to the landlord. Don't put the unfair burden upon the landlord. In a government like we have, you share the burden. We have property taxes. People who make more money pay more taxes. People who make less money pay less taxes. There are a lot of people who don't pay any taxes. But to put the unfair, undue burden upon a landlord, just because they scrimped and saved and worked hard to save their money to buy one extra property or two extra properties to provide not only an income for themselves, but a low income housing unit for someone else who couldn't afford to buy a property is, it, is unconstitutional. It's wrong to put that burden upon the landlord without any commensurate um, giving back. Like, you know, utilities right now, Pasadena Utility Company, uh, Pasadena Water and Power, they're not charging late fees. They're not turning off water and power for people. But you know what? It certainly would be helpful if um, some of these landlords are having difficulty because their landlord, their tenants are not paying the rent. Why not say, you know what? We'll waive your common area water. We'll waive your trash. But they're not. And, you know, right now, um, I think just last month, a couple of weeks ago, there was a, a window of seven days in which landlords were encouraged to talk to their tenants and say, hey, there is tenant money available um, that's going to be given by the federal government. Go and apply. But, you know, City of Pasadena can only give up to $4,000, I think it is, per tenant. Well, a lot of these people are living in units that are 2000 3000 a month. That's only going to cover a month or two of rent. So what happens to the landlord? So what I would suggest is with this money that's coming from the government on the weekly or biweekly um, setup is maybe just like um, a notice of levy that served upon someone who hasn't paid their taxes, maybe, you know, where the money is automatically deducted. Maybe a small percentage of that money that's coming from the government automatically should be veered off to the landlord so that the tenant in turn is also not buried. They're going to end up filing bankruptcy. Who wants a bankruptcy on their record? You don't want eviction. Who wants bankruptcy? That's even worse. So to have eviction and bankruptcy doesn't make sense. And I think landlords really are good people. I mean, we're, I'm a landlord. Almost all my clients are landlords. And it's very important that you have a good relationship. You want a good community. You want people to survive and thrive. You don't want to be um, putting people out on the street. So I think it really behooves 
all the people who are making these decisions to recognize landlords are people just like tenants are. And if you could sit back and recognize that the majority of everybody is working really hard together to not get coronavirus and to pay their bills. It's for the people that are on the fringe that are the terrible landlords that are forcing these fake evictions that you can't even do right now. And I don't care what Dennis Block says, it's, it's foolish to try and do an eviction right now. But you know what? It would be very nice if some of these tenants who can't afford to pay their rent right now said, you know what? I have a mom and dad who live out of state or in another city or whatever, and I can't work right now anyway. I'm going to go and live in their spare bedroom so that maybe you have the chance of re-renting out your unit to try and recover some of the money because I can't pay it. I think you would find a lot of landlords would say, you know, I think that's extremely um, noble and we'll work with you. And of course, we're not going to pursue anything because we've had a good relationship. And I think that's where I started in this whole thing is that I think we have gotten off on our moral compass and we need to start recognizing people want to do right. And those who don't want to do right, they're not going to do right anyway. But those who want to do right, give them the opportunity to do that and help them so that we can all work together and have a beautiful community. Hey, Ryan, I'm going to, to direct this question to you first, and then I, I would like to get Anne-Marie's response on this as well. Recently, there was uh, some controversy in the Pasadena area uh, surrounding landlords who did not want to uh, open up their uh, available um, rentals to, to uh, lower income, that they would rather have an unoccupied unit than, than have to rent at lower than the quote-unquote market rate. Uh, I was wondering if you could speak on that. I mean, well, uh, are you asking? Brian, um, the thing is, is it's uh, very hard to Anne -Marie, put... we, we, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we wanted Ryan to, to answer. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you said Anne-Marie. So go ahead, Ryan. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this goes back to, to really my central point is that, you know, some people own their homes, some people rent their homes, and then other people have investment properties um, that uh, create, frankly, shortages and higher prices in the housing market. And so a lot of people buy housing that they don't ever intend to rent. It's just a place to park their capital uh, so that it can increase in value. Housing has always been a, a good investment. Um, for the most part, except for when it's not, uh, which is very rarely like 2008 and perhaps right now, um, when, um, and so when, you know, t uh, housing is deliberately left vacant, um, it really calls into question whether we have a housing crisis or whether we have, you know, an availability crisis or people willing to, to rent. I, when I worked for PATH in Los Angeles, you know, it was a, a massive struggle to find a landlord who would accept even Section 8 vouchers, which isn't even the, the lowest of the low income. Um, lots of people have Section 8 vouchers. Luckily, now there's a law that prohibits discrimination against Section 8 ap applicants. Um, and, and I think, you know, when you go into a place and you buy up property as an investment and raise the prices, it presses everyone out. And you're going to have a you're going to have an enclave of the very rich and I don't know who's gonna wash your car or ba bag your groceries or serve your dinner. Um, you know, it's, it's ex extremely insulting to suggest that someone who's been renting for 40 years, they just didn't happen to think that maybe they should buy a house. Like it just didn't dawn on them or something. Like maybe they didn't have savings to buy a house. I've been renting all, my entire life. I'm 48 years old. You don't think I'd like to have a house? About 10 years ago, I went out to uh, get a mortgage to see how much mortgage I could qualify for. And I qualified for about $140,000 mortgage. I was a full-time pastor making about $80,000 a year that in, in, um, in um, you know, probably 10 years ago. And that was all the house I could afford. As a professional working full-time, where do you, you know, we, would, we, we did uh, research as an organization back then where you know, teachers, police officers, firefighters don't make enough money to live in the communities that they serve. We've suddenly, you know, learned a great deal about who's essential in our communities. And people that are essential are people that pick up our trash, people that uh, teach our children, people that bag our groceries, um, people that take care of us when we're sick. These folks are of, among the large class of people who rent because they cannot afford to buy a home 
in this neighborhood. So you think, well, maybe they can move to Pomona. Well, guess what? I can't afford to buy a house in Pomona either. And I don't want to drive an hour to work. Why should I have to? Why should I have to drive an hour to work, contribute to all that pollution, all that waste of time, all that time I'm not with my kids or with my family? It's just an inhumane way to be. And to suggest that people are just lazy or they didn't think to buy a house when they could have is really insulting. And I think there, there's just a lack of general compassion and empathy for the people who have invested their whole lives in building up this community, working in this community, and now are, are just left with nothing. The well, same people who were redlined out of Pasadena, by the way, a, a few decades ago. All right, well, I'd like to respond to that. You're saying that uh, there's very low inventory. Well, with all the government regulations and all of the unbelievable onerous and exorbitant fees, and the requirements to get housing built, it, there's no question that prices are going to be higher here. So even uh, at the beginning of the year, our governor, Newsom, gruesome Newsom, said, you know what, second units, you can build them, third units on the property. So of course, some people panicked because they thought there were going to be too many extra units in the neighborhood. But it takes a lot of work to get those units approved through the city. So it's not as easy as you think. And it's really sad because People would be benefiting from that if there was a little one bedroom apartment or a studio apartment on the back of someone's house or in their backyard that they could rent there. They could live in a beautiful neighborhood. They could have in it and the rent probably would be lower than buy, you know, renting into one of these new uh, newer units here in uh, Pasadena that have been built recently. And the new units that are built in Pasadena, they're expensive. They're very expensive. And they're expensive because they have paid so much in mortgage interest, time, waiting to get things through, having to rebuild things, whatever it is that they've had to do in the requirements. So if the regulations were reduced so that we didn't have such onerous uh, requirements for all the reviews, et cetera, and as long as they just built it, you know, at the early 1900s, people used to be able to get out of Sears Robot. You could buy house plans and you could build that same house over and over again. Why can't we do that again? You know, Pasadena, pretty uh, homogenous as far as the terrain and all, the soil types, et cetera. Why not have these you know, things set up so that we can replicate it so that it doesn't cost so much money? And I mean, you know, the point that you're making you is that about, the and I free market can't deliver housing. Like, the wait, free market can't insulted. deliver housing to Pasadena. It, it's too, it, it, there needs to be another way, a decommodified way to provide housing to people as a need, as a right. People yes, would pay, you know they would contribute no, There to is it. no obligation for anyone other than the government to provide, um, if they want to provide housing vouchers. Right, but exactly. no, they, I, have no, I, have no um, I can't go to Beverly Hills and say, I want a $20 million house. I'm not saying you know? that either. And you know that I'm not saying that. No, okay. but you were saying that everybody should be Again, here. And you know, some gonna, people may I'm just not have the income to do that. Because we are, we're running a little short on time, and I did want to get to one or two other questions. Uh, most importantly, perhaps, uh, the original, we discussed this early on in the program, the original uh, eviction moratorium actually expired on July 31st. But as of the 22nd, it was actually extended through September. Uh, however, there has been a lot of, of argument and uh, no real movement forward on extending the $600 uh, weekly uh, addition to unemployment. And as it stands right now, it's beginning to look like nothing is going to come of that anytime soon. Uh, I was wondering if both of you could speak to the effects that is going to have on both uh, renters and tenants in the very near future. Well, and I yeah, think people some people are already are lining up for food at, at food banks. You know, there are people, middle class people are lining up in cities around the country to get food. And the government is, you know, sitting on its hands um, you know, in New Zealand, they told folks to stay home for two months. They paid them 80% of their salary and now they're over the coronavirus. It's gone for the most part. And here, you know, we put the most vulnerable people on the front lines and then, you know, give them, you know, kind of some scraps to try to pass through to their landlord and they can't afford it. They can't afford to live un under these circumstances. People but you know, I'll give you a different side of this story though, Ryan, because I know that there are a lot of people in my industry, in the real estate industry, who have not been as successful selling real estate. And they actually are doing much better right now getting the government um, checks. And sure. that's a sad situation as well because uh, there's really no incentive for them to work. 
It's better well, for I mean, them to do these what checks. I've, what I've said is basically that if you're doing better with the $600 increase in unemployment, then you weren't being paid fairly to, in the first place. So if you're still employed, on you've got unemployment was getting poorly paid and should, as you advised me to do earlier, go to their boss and say, I need to make more money. Yes. I, I, I work think for a nonprofit, is by the way, out. which is based on yeah. people's donations. And I don't just get to go and like, I don't work harder and make more money. I work harder and make the same money because I work in the nonprofit sector because our government doesn't provide for people the way that some other countries okay. do. You have to talk to me about hard work. I work so hard, and I know there are a lot of people who work hard. Doesn't sure. matter what field you're in, there are hard workers in every field, and there are slackers in every field. But it does not mean that a landlord has to provide free housing. So, say, what if suddenly the government said, you know what, Ryan, you have a brother. Your brother's not paying his rent. I want you to pay his rent. But you can't do that. And you take offense to that and say, that's crazy. I'm not going to pay for my brother's rent. But now look at it from the landlord situation. The landlord's now being told, you've got a tenant who can't pay their rent. You pay it for them. And but that's what's happening risk, right now. As a landlord, you took a risk on an investment. Just like if you bought some stocks and the CEO made some bad decisions and your stock price went down, like that's a risk. And when you- Yes, but you know what? There's a person involved in that. That's right. very different. A tenant who is Someone also a person. Who has decided who not to pay the rent. Who can't live on the street successfully and raise their kids. So I agree, and, the, and 1436, AB 1436 is designed to help homeowners as well, not just tenants. You know, there's gonna, when we did in 2018, when the federal government bailed out big businesses, that stuff never trickled down. People got evicted from their homes, they got foreclosed on by banks and banks gave CEOs massive raises. And what we're saying yeah, this but, time around- Well, that's not, that, but the landlords can also lose their homes, as you say, so they can be foreclosed upon. So not only is the tenant in a bad situation, the landlord's in a really rough spot too. Not under the, not under the legislation that we're advocating, you wouldn't lose your home as a homeowner because people well, need housing. Again, well then, but you still have to give something to the landlord. Say then remove the property taxes for the year. But you have to give something it. in return. Nobody's forgiving rent. We would like to see rent forgiveness and then the government make landlords whole. Well, but the truth is people cannot recoup six, eight, ten months of rent that they have. You're not telling paid. me. That's the hard. So they're going to be, as I said, declaring bankruptcy. We don't want that. And then they have but to be evicted. You don't want that. It's not good for society. So again, I go back. We need a moral compass. And if people would work together, a lot of people would find that their housing would be okay. And I think it, it would also incentivize people to go and talk to their employers and say, hey, I need a little bit more. You're getting, I read in the paper, you got PPP money. Share a little bit of the wealth. Well, and with that, I have to, to interrupt and say that, unfortunately, we have reached the end of our program this evening. We're, we're out of time. I, I did want to thank Ms. Anne-Marie Villacana and Mr. Ryan thank Bell you. for joining us this thank evening. You. It has been a wonderful conversation. We certainly appreciate both points of view. Uh, to you at home, if there are topics you would like to see addressed in our discussions, you can email them to us at arroyolive at pasadenamedia.org, and we may include them in a future broadcast. This has been Arroyo Live. I'm Joe Carbonetta. Thank you so much for watching, and good night.